is a group of people who have started our program right now, and uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, the European Society of uh, International Law Lecture by Professor Dr. Uh, Armin Momogandhi on sovereign debt restructuring as exercises of international public authority towards a decentralized sovereign solvency law. As I'm here wearing two hats as a proud co-organizer of this conference and also as a, the current ISIL uh, Vice President. The European Society of International Law is a relatively young learned society which goals are to contribute to the rule of law in international relations and to promote the study of public international law. One of the recently uh, launched programs uh, of the society is its new series of uh, ISIL lectures. We have started these uh, series of lectures with the uh, best-selling author uh, Daniel Goldhagen on October 2011 in the University of Basel. Today we are delighted uh, to continue a series of lectures uh, with the uh, director of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. Professor Fomo Bamdi is a leading global jurist who has made significant, lasting, already lasting contributions to um, um, international law, but not only to international law, uh, also to uh, constitutional law, European law, and uh, philosophy and the philosophy of law. Um, this lecture today is uh, part of what I would call one of his most uh, uh, transcendental uh, projects, that is the development of what he has uh, defined as the publicness of international law, um, a fascinating, fascinating program to build a possible legal framework for global governance uh, activities. Um, Professor Colin Bandy, we have the floor. Thank you very much.
going on. Not only a Venus, but they are also actors. And that was, uh, so that was the top element. And global governance develops that. In two fields, so first, the global governance research says <coughs> international institutions are important, they are actors. Um, <coughs> they are administrations. And, but the governance concept expands this idea because governance says these institutions are not only formal institutions, they can also be informal institutions, like the G7, the G8, or the Paris Club, or the London Club. We see that we have a lot of these kinds of animals in, uh, in the international system, which are not formal institutions, they are hybrids, like the office of government things and so on. And the, the point that those governance research tells us, look at these broad-term institutions, processes, they are real things that And I think here they are right, and that's why we have to do this So this is one of the important innovations of that kind of research. Uh, the second insight is that the governance highlights the move to informality. So governance research says, don't only look at what at the sources are as witness. No. We have a lot of instruments by which these kind of institutions uh, change policy, influence policy, which we cannot see with the traditional concepts. So it's the move to informality, and the G7, the G8, uh, the European Council, as it was at the beginning, all are part of that move. That very important is done in an informal, in an informal uh, way. The third element then is uh, not only to focus on actors, but on procedures and how because very often in these informal settings it is very difficult to identify one single actor, uh, one single actor, very often in a network group which are informal. But what you have is a certain procedure and a certain moment. So not, don't look only at uh, And then the fourth element is um, in the term global. What comes with this? Well, the, the, the core of the idea is to look at this and these phenomena in a multi-level dimension. Don't only look at the international level, don't only look at the national level. You have, you need a framework that looks at both, that links the two, so that the, the music is playing in the interaction between these two levels. That is the fourth very important in the innovation by the concept of uh, global governance. And I think these, these four elements are important to us. I think they thus get a standard of insight that we as lawyers should uh, elaborate. Now, what are the decisions? So, so we start from that. But then we come as lawyers, and uh, we also see that there are problems with this concept. That's why we don't do global governance, but we do international public authority. Um, and the point is that, um, first of all, global governance really comes in the technocratic tradition. tradition. It is very much about uh, efficiency, it's very much about outcomes. And all the normative part, which is important uh, to us, such as uh, human rights, accountability, uh, <coughs> Well, this is, it's not completely alien to them, but it's not important. The idea is to get results. Now, given the, the developments that we have had, and once again, the watershed was the, the, the Al Qaeda Taliban uh, uh, policy set, there is something missing. And the same is true with restructuring. Well, even if it is efficient, the, the aspect of fairness has to be part of it. And in fact, a lot of claims have been brought that these outcomes, these institutions, these procedures are illegitimate. Uh, attack and a lot of groups are voicing concern and stating this policy is illegitimate. And here now comes an important point. International law so far has almost no instrument 
instrument to translate these concerns about legitimacy into arguments on legality. And that is something very important because if you look at developed liberal and democratic states, almost any concern that is voiced in the public sphere when it is said that a certain policy is, uh, is illegitimate, and I think in Spain we are having a very intense discussion at the moment, there is a possibility to translate these concerns into issues of legality, and then there are four where you can dispute it as, uh, as uh, contrasting kinds of and this is a very important element for the stability of a policy, that you have these forms of translation and to elaborate them, the crisis of uh, legitimacy is the concept of legality. Now when it comes to international governance phenomena, you don't have that. We have all these claims of, of uh, illegitimacy, but no real translation into the of legality. So we think that this is a big, big lacuna where we should move into. That is the first one. And, um, and the second one is that this global governance research is too vague and too hazy what we should really study. Because we as lawyers, our mind is analytical. Our mind is to start with an individual act and to study the legality of an individual act. We don't study broad procedures. We study procedures coming from a, uh, from a specific act. So that is also a lacuna in this type of, um, of, uh, uh, of research. And for, uh, for that reason, we think in order to, to deal with these issues in a legal, in a, in a legal uh, setting, we need to move forward and we need to find a conceptuality which allows legal thought to unfold. Now, um, Um, and uh, our proposal is that the concept of international public authority might be that foundational uh, uh, concept. So the idea is that these institutions like uh, the Security Council, the IFF, also the Paris Club and the London Club, that are wonderful examples, that's why we are so grateful to you that you propose us to develop it, should be conceived as institutions of public authority. Now this requires a big innovation in a, in a foundational conceptuality of uh, legal thinking because so far the concept of public authority is um, intrinsically linked with the concept of the state. And public authority only under uh, traditional thinking, and here we have the we have the Adidas and Skelson now, so uh, it's uh, it's still Adidas and Skelson. So, uh, so what does Carlson say with William and all the others? They say public authorities only the institutions that have the control, the monopoly of the legitimate forces of coercion. So only an institution that has a police and that has an army really is an institution of authority. And it is clear that the IMF may, may be as powerful as it wishes, is, isn't under that conceptuality an institution of public authority. So that is the traditional understanding which still informs a lot of thinking on uh, on law, public law. But so but our intuition is that this is insufficient today. And times have changed since Hans Kels and Max Weber broke. If you look at the in the early uh, early 20th century, the world was very different. Today we see that these institutions are have an impact on our lives as important as uh, state policy, that like some people, my family, my kids, all, all suddenly we were working with the kids on math and uh, German because of that pizza policy that they were doing. <laughs> so, um, they are very influential. So the idea is, it is meaningful to expand the concept of uh, public authority in light of that intuition that these institutions are, uh, have become powerful. Now, how do we uh, move there? Well, we may we propose a broader definition. So we propose a definition, and it's important to see that the definition does not respond to criteria of truth, but to criteria of utility. Is the definition useful? That's how we look at the definition. We don't say, is the definition true? 
we will say is the definition um, uh, meaningful towards the end of our research. So what is our proposal? Our proposal is that we broaden the concept and that we say that authority is the legal concept to determine others, to reduce their freedom in a unilateral way. But in a human, that the institution has the possibility to deter, to unilaterally shape the legal or factual situation of others. That is, um, uh, that is the concept. And then an exercise of public authority is the realization of that legal capacity, usually by standard instruments. Now, this determination might be legally binding, and there are the traditional instruments, but it might be also non-binding. And in fact, uh, uh, a very important part of global governance instruments are instruments which are legally not binding, but which nevertheless have a very deep impact on uh, the, uh, the situation, the domestic situation. Thus, take the visa rankings. Thus, take the visa rankings, or when, uh, or just take when uh, uh, certain indicators are put out on the situation of a country and that has a huge impact, very often an impact which is supposed to deeper than an impact of a legal, uh, of a legal act. So, one has to look, when these institutions are acting, what you have to look at is uh, what is the setting in which this policy comes. And if, if the act which is elaborated by the institution is put into a framework that leads to the other side little choice but to follow that impact, we think that we have a phenomenon of public uh, authority. And it doesn't have to be so strong as the Godfather. The Godfather says, you always make proposals that you cannot refuse. Because you know otherwise it will be shot. It doesn't have to go so far. But when it comes to work with reputational costs, with borrowing costs, with uh, the cost of the the reputation of your workforce is you're always very low in the PISA rankings. That is a very important uh, incentive for, uh, uh, for, for state institutions, uh, for parliaments to move into that uh, direction. Now let me apply that thought to our friends here, the IMF, the London Club, and, and the Paris Club. In what extent can we say that this is, is public um, authority? So we have three elements, uh, authority, publicness, and international. So authority that is, um, as we said, it's global governance institutions. They can, act, they can uh, have mu a multiplicity of forms. They can do soft law instruments uh, or only indicators. So what is public? Public character is, uh, sorry, so uh, the first one is, uh, that they have authority so that they can issue uh, statements, communicative acts, if you put it in the linguistic field, communicative acts that put huge pressure on, uh, on other individuals. And I think in this case, IMF is very clear, unconditionality is the agreed minutes uh, by the Paris Club, it's also very clear that uh, what is stated there is uh, authoritative and will be implemented. And the same is also true with the, um, uh, with the London Club. If the banks agree that a certain way of restructuring should happen, it is very likely that that is built, uh, that will be implemented. So this is, uh, this is the first element. The second element that is um, the publicness, now, when an act has a public character or a private character, that depends on the legal basis. So, whenever the act of an authority, uh, an act of an authority act may claim to have acted on a legal basis, entitling it to act unilateral decisions, which deeply affect individuals or community, then that act is uh, an act of public authority. So, it's the unilateral. The legal basis here might be one of hard law, but it might also be one of soft law. Of, um, and, well, that is a very critical element uh, when it comes to the Paris Club. And in fact, it is an intricate theoretical question whether soft law should be considered as part of international law problem. And that is a debate that we have to have for uh, at least 30 or uh, 40 years. And this, that depends very much on, this, uh, on the concept of law which is used. 
trying to convince the cats on the internet. So it's not about replicating it, that would be stupid. But these are core questions we need to find on the internet. So this is, uh, this is constitutional, it's the, the one attempt to move beyond, um, beyond uh, functionalism. Uh, what we see as a problem of this approach is um, that it is a little too aloof from the technicalities. And the technicalities, as we will see with Southern uh, Oregon planning, are very important. So I think uh, all these technical parts, the administrative part, the instrumental part, they are not really, they are not, uh, really uh, well represented in the region. Uh, that is one point. And the second point is that it is a, two, a step just too far away to think of international institutions. And here uh, comes in my, my, my experience from European Union law. We have had such a long discussion for 20 years whether we should concede, consider the primary law of the European Union as having constitutional value or not, and has been a very rich debate. And so my position is in the European Union, you can make that argument. Your citizenship in the parliament and the law. But for international institutions, it's, it's too long. It's just a step too far away. Therefore, we think that constitutionalism is, is, is not the best founding conceptuality of the view. Then we have the second, uh, the second important school, and that is the global, uh, it's called, global administrative law, developed by Sabine uh, Cassese in Italy and uh, NYU, Kingsbury, and Fish, and Stewart, and they have built up a huge school. And they are also very important because what they say is these institutions they have a very important administrative part. So let's use our insight, our rich insight from how to control the exterior domestic administrative institutions and in order to improve their working, both under the uh, aspect of efficiency as under the other concept of accountability. So let's use the wealth of, um, of knowledge and apply it, uh, apply it to international um, uh, to international institutions. So uh, that that has been a very important step, and we think they are they are right. They are right in saying that we can learn a lot from domestic administrative law. International institutions, as we know that today, are mostly built on ideas of domestic ministries in uh, either the twenty thirties or the early fifties. Now, domestic uh, administration has evolved. Try to bring that knowledge to international. Great and we will do that. But we don't think that this is the, the, the right overarching basis for uh, three uh, main reasons. Uh, one is, or let me just give you two. One is that global administrative law is too low. It blurs the line between the domestic level and the international. And that cannot work for you thought. Because in law, when we are thinking, when we are doing what we have to do at the core, that is to say, when we have to make an argument of legality, the first thing that we have to do is to, be, to determine whether this is an act of international law or whether there is an act of national law. All other questions on legality, legitimacy, responsible institution depends on that. So that is one that problem that we are facing. I mean, another one is. That, it, that administration is not the right concept because a concept only works if it has uh, other concepts that, uh, that deliver it. Now, the concept of administration in domestic law, as you all know, only works if you have the administration and the judiciary. And only with respect to these other concepts, the concept of administration will really work. At the international level, we don't have it. We don't have a legislature and even a judiciary that um, forms uh, an institutional whole with, with these bureaucracies. For that reason, our idea is that uh, administration is a problematic concept. And what we propose is, and in fact, administration is a concept that has developed only since the early 19th century. Um, so our proposal is to go back to broader concept with the concept of And then the third element, uh, the third approach is the 
instruments are very good. And all the technicalities. So we think of it recently uh, the public law approach might be uh, useful. Now if you apply that to the uh, to the institutions, the IMF, I think there's no problem that they are uh, that that is a uh, public authority in terms of treaty uh, conditionality. It is more difficult with respect to the Paris Club because the Paris Club lacks a binding international uh, has no basis in international law. But we say uh, we say don't start with institutions, start with the outcome. Then you have the agreed minutes uh, of the IMF. And we think that these agreed minutes can be conceived as exercise of public authority. First of all, they are acts of authority because they affect the scale of default as well as its population. But they also uh, affect uh, creditors. Uh, so um, they are unilateral and they are imposing. And once that you have disagreed minutes, it's very difficult to, to get into this. So they, they have this element of authority. The second element is uh, that they are public. Um, they are based on the normative framework of the Paris Club and they are the will of public actors, mainly government officials, acting under their domestic authorizations. Certainly these, uh, they have not non-binding character, but if you, if you look at it and you see very well on their website, they have a very rich regime of procedural principles and of, uh, of substantive principles. Um, so, here we have a framework, and this framework uh, is set up as a, as, a, as a soft law framework. And then the third element is um, whether they are international public authority. And I also think this is also very key because we have uh, the person from the, the Spanish Ministry of Finance, from the German Ministry of Finance, from the American Ministry of Finance, and they come together and they are forming the common will and the formation of common will by international. Uh, by state actors is what is international since the day of the event. Now what is more much more difficult is the issue uh, with the London Club because they have the private banks discussing with, uh, with the uh, debt to state. But we think uh, there's also a possibility to argue it. So that the authority of interest is quite clear because uh, once you have such a settlement it will be on post on others. What is more difficult is uh, whether it has, a, uh, it has a, uh, an element of publicness. Yes. I think those who have read the paper, they are ready to attack us on that point. We won't defend it too much to construction. So one way, uh, what we are trying in the paper is to do it with acquiescence. But let me put it on, what, is, what for us is clear and on what we want to do uh, lay our construction is that the IMF and the states are using these uh, uh, the outcomes of the Latin Club. And these outcomes are even encouraged by the IMF. So we said this is enough, now let's go for a legal construction to, to impute it to the state and to make it authoritative for them. So one element is might be uh, that acquiescence, so we have an outcome and uh, the states are happy with it, that needs a little move in the definition of acquiescence, and we'll see whether you think that's useful. Another one might be uh, a delegation. There might be an element of delegation that the states say, if there's such a problem, it should be tackled in the London Club. And there are elements for that because the IMF, at least in certain uh, situations, has said to the, uh, to the delegate country, go to the London Club and find it. So when we find that, then we have a delegation, and then it works. The same logic, uh, for example, with ICANN. There can also be the incorporation, so that once uh, an agreement has been found between the, the London, those who are negotiating the London Cup and the other uh, country, that then the result is used by states, and for that reason, to say, well, these, the states may only use the results if certain public, certain public law requirements have been fulfilled. So I think. Uh, there is a possibility to argue that uh, these, uh, these outcomes should be conceived as exercise of public authority. I'm over my time. Uh, so uh, let me end on the note that I think within this conceptual framework it is possible to, um, to develop standards um, because there's and 
the development of, of this law of uh, <coughs> self debt restructuring, it is twofold. As I think the development of most people thought, it, on the one hand, it is deductive, and also your principles are the way deductive. So you have for very broad considerations of um, fairness and uh, justice, which I try to do, human rights standards, which I try to do, I the rule of law. So you have broad ideas on, on what to do, right? And then you have the inductive part that you look what is already out there as uh, positive law. And I, I, what I found really interesting in the papers is, uh, and what we found in this research, is quite a lot is already out there in the positive law that can be used, be it a good faith principle, uh, historical principle. A lot of elements can be used in order to construe it. So I think in that light, it can be, it can be developed. It can be developed in the, uh, by scholars. But I think it's also quite easy then to convince courts, domestic courts, or even a, a Nixit tribunal, that these principles have, can play a role when deciding on a case. So I think by a step by step down we can construe here uh, a public law framework for these, uh, for these activities, and I think the principles might play a very important role in that. Thank you very much for your attention. And Thank you. 
I think for good reason. Um, for that uh, for that reason, I would think that this is principle that affects to be used in our degree for the I don't know now whether I don't know the briefing is by the uh, um, by the ministries, but I imagine that this uh, that has been brought. But I, I can't I can't tell you so whether this what is this or Uh, I think you explained eloquently about the current public authorities in the area of debt instances, especially debt restructuring, and you emphasized the area of and and, uh, <coughs> and you said at the very beginning is a great need to be efficient and fair. I'm asking whether the Paris Club is really very fair, because the Paris Club is a group of creditors. Unplanned has been serving as observers in the Paris Club when we know the debtor countries really need support. So we used to be very helpful in this aspect, now the debtors are more on their own. So uh, you have one debtor going to the Paris Club, facing the creditors to present their cases, and many times they don't know really how to present them. They may not get the best out of the Paris Club. And also for the Paris Club, their decisions have they always been correct before the Hippie Initiative they treated the huge unsustainable debt problem as a liquidity problem and, and until many movements including UNCAD who have voices to say this is not a liquidity problem, it's a solvency pro problem and then it came into be of uh, this Hippie Initiative. Uh, and here, of course, IMF also has the problem. IMF is now undergoing voice reform and all these things. So uh, I'm thinking that the only public authorities you are talking about, the IMF and the Paris Club and the <coughs> and London's, uh, London Club, will, will they, uh, have they been uh, fair and very efficient? Will there be the need for reform and things like that? Thank you. Thank you for, uh, uh, for your question. Um, are these pro procedures fair? When you put it that way, I think you can think of making them fairer. And um, the point here, uh, the, the, the problematic point we have to think of is that much of uh, what we have been thinking on how to make uh, global governance phenomena fairer and the insight that we have are geared towards regulatory policy. Um, now here we are in a different field because we are about uh, debt restructuring. And we, we should discuss carefully to what extent principle of fairness when it comes to regulation. And there we have a wealth of knowledge how to make it better. It's uh, knowledge and command, uh, transparency, um, uh, certain forms of accountability. You know, we have a wealth of, of ideas how to make uh, regulatory, regulatory pro uh, policy more fair. And the question is, to what extent does it really apply to the situation of debt restructuring? And um, <coughs> is it the same so that we can apply uh, all these insights? Or what is specific in that situation that we have to apply the, 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 the received wisdom of? Uh, uh, making regulatory pro policy more fair. Um, so so that, that is something that we, that we should discuss, and I think uh, there are some specificities in the second situation that we have to, to, to deal with. Having said that, um, um, we make in our, in our paper a, a number of proposals how that these procedures can be made uh, uh, more fair. And what we have been suggesting I think it's very interesting that's to say that the, the UNCTAD might serve as an observer and might uh, give, give a further insight into the deliberations of the Paris Club so that uh, you have somehow a more independent voice and, and a broader perspective. I think that is certainly something very helpful to this uh, procedure and might be, uh, might be very helpful. Uh, thank you. I found your uh, way of thinking uh, about informal and formal institutions in this area um, as being voted with public authority very insightful. Uh, I was wondering, however, whether you see evidence uh, on the part of what state, whether states 
and international institutions themselves and also courts are prepared to go down that route. Looking, for example, at the International Monetary Fund, the International Monetary Fund has for a long time taken the view of that standby arrangements, it concludes with member countries, uh, are, uh, do not have the quality of treaties. They are just unilateral undertakings by the borrowing country, therefore they don't have to be ratified um, by Parliament. Now you can think of good reasons why uh, the IMF would want to adopt that position and why member countries um, of the IMF want to adopt that position. Uh, it, it seems to be the case that generally also if you think about um, sovereign debt restructuring where the IMF in many cases effectively determines um, how, how many losses private creditors suffer, um, that they want to keep that below um, the radar um, screen. The IMF um, gives recommendations to its member countries um, that doesn't affect their international legal obligations and it seems that the IMF, its member countries and also courts um, are very are generally happy with the status quo and I see a little willingness um, to move towards a recognition that the IMF in fact exercises public authority that can be very intrusive uh, into um, borrowing members. Thank you. Uh, First of all, is there um, evidence that uh, things are moving into that direction? I think you can find some evidence. If you go through our paper, you will see that there are uh, some instances where uh, uh, domestic courts uh, and uh, international tribunals are starting to, uh, to discuss it. So there is some evidence. Um, and I think that the exercise that UNCTAD is doing and uh, the idea to have this conference is, is part of it in raising, uh, in raising uh, this awareness. Um, and I think you can make the, uh, the comparison with um, um, the protection uh, of investment. For a very long time, the idea has been that uh, is it an investment protection is really under a private law paradigm and it should be done with under a private law paradigm and that, that is a heavy setting and then uh, increasingly uh, in the public sphere concerns of legitimacy were raised and I think are now in a very broad movement to, to stress uh, the public law element of exit, uh, of exit arbitration which then leads uh, to the idea that other concerns such as human rights concerns are becoming more uh, important and uh, you, you can see within uh, in the treaties now a different practice by many states that uh, uh, bilateral investment treaties are, uh, are termed in a different way and something similar might be happening here. I think that is our role as being academics to, to even think into directions where we still don't have practice but where building on our uh, key of, uh, of principles and on the document that we have so far received how things should develop. So I think uh, so my response is yes, there is some evidence, uh, but at the same time you are correct that important uh, the players in the field don't want to, to change uh, the way they are uh, acting.